Let us pray. May the Lord be on our mind and on our lips and in our hearts as we listen and understand your word. Amen. I neglected to say during announcements, Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. So I feel that I need to begin this morning with a few words about recent developments uh, in our country. As you may or may not be aware, it appears that the Supreme Court of the United States is poised to make a radical change to women's health care. I say radical because it has been considered, and the last three Supreme Court nominees agreed in their hearings, that the rights under attack should be considered settled law. Now let me state as clearly as I can that I support anyone's right to choose. But my opinion on the matter does not come into account when it's another's decision. The position of the church, any church, this church or any church, should not come into account when it's someone else's choice. My hope, though, is that any decision is made after much consultation with informed medical professionals and others, and after much prayer. But in the end, it's a decision that individuals must make. Unlike some, I do not stand in judgment of anyone. As your pastor, I'm here to support you and help you in any way that you can. I have never and will never force personal beliefs on anyone. In fact, this is the first time in 17 years of ordained ministry that I have ever spoken on this topic, ever. My desire is, to have, is for everyone to have access to whatever they feel they need and make whatever decisions they feel they need to make that's best for them and for their families. If you don't like abortion, that's your choice. Don't try to take that choice away from anyone else. As has been said, if you don't like it, don't get one. We enjoy a tremendous amount of freedom in this country, more freedom than many others, but part of that freedom is to allow others to have freedom. And sometimes we don't always agree with that freedom. We don't always agree with the choices that other people make, but those are other people, not us. Quite frankly, it's none of our business. Personal freedom is just that, personal. If your freedom does not infringe on mine, it's none of my business. Now just a quick word, because I feel also compelled to say something about the so-called pro-life movement. If you truly wish to be pro-life, then your concern for the unborn needs to extend to the entire spectrum of life. The entire spectrum of life. If you're truly pro-life, then you should be concerned with affordable health care for all. Affordable housing for all. Jobs that pay living wages for all. Education for all. The end of state-sponsored murder, child poverty, war, and getting vaccinated. All of these are life issues. And we should be concerned about all of them. We need to stop using our religion to push a political agenda. Because what happens if we don't is the political agenda becomes the religious agenda. And the lines get so blurred that you can't tell the difference where one ends and the other one begins. Now today's story from the Acts of the Apostles begins at a funeral. It happens. Fred knows well the funerals happen. <laughs> Tabitha has died, and others have come to pay respects to her. 
By all accounts, Tabitha was an amazing woman. She made clothing for those who could not afford them. She was described as a disciple of the way. And she obviously took Jesus' command to love others and clothe them very seriously because this is what she did. She specifically helped the widows in her community. Another command that Jesus gave us. Many of these widows had no one to care for them. And so Tabitha stepped up and became her family. Now Tabitha's friends did what they needed to do and they laid her out and they sent word to Peter. Now it's unclear if her friends felt that any sort of miracle would take place. And the story's really not about the miracle, although it's kind of hard not to be amazed at this raising from the dead bit, right? But it's really not about that. I'm not sure what their expectations might have been. But another person had just been healed in one of the neighboring towns. And so perhaps they just thought, well, maybe something could happen. So they sent for Peter. Now, just as Jesus had done earlier when he healed, he healed the daughter of Jairus, Peter sent the mourners out of the room. He prayed. But then he simply turned and said, Tabitha, get up. And she did. Now, I don't know if Peter was surprised by this. I know I would be. You all probably would be as well. I mean, first of all, no one listens to me. So even if I said get up, I would be surprised if she got up. But there she was, sitting up. Peter takes her hand and helps her, and everything's well again. One life was continuing to change the lives of many. We read that because of this event, a lot of people changed their lives. A lot of people became believers. They became followers because of this that happened. God's raising of Tabitha was a deed of compassion that turns the existing world and everything that we know about the world on its head. The message of Jesus continues to change the way we think about everything, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, perhaps while Tabitha's friends were gathered, they prayed the 23rd Psalm. I think sometimes we forget the Psalms that we hear, the Psalms that we read were prayers. And they were prayed. And they were prayed in times of distress. They were prayed in times of joy. They were prayed. These were the prayers of the church. Now, this is one of my favorite Psalms, and I use it a lot. It's the funeral Psalm. I use it a lot of funerals, but I use it in a lot of other gatherings as well. It uses the motif of the shepherd tending to their sheep. We talk about sheep a lot. Sheep rely on the shepherd for everything. And if the shepherd cares for the sheep, the sheep lack nothing. But the psalm here raises a very interesting distinction sometimes gets overlooked. It's the difference between a want and a need. Just because we think we need it doesn't make it a need. We don't always see this clear distinction, especially when it involves us. Now, we may feel again that we need something, but it turns out to be more of a want. Now, I'm a firm believer in the idea that God knows us better than we know ourselves. And sometimes this is a little off-putting. Of course, we might pray to win the lottery, or perhaps we pray that we bet some money on that 80 to 1 long shot horse that won the derby <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but we didn't. Well, I don't think anybody did. But God knows what we will do with it, or not do with it. And so in the long run, it doesn't happen. I'm not saying God controls the lottery, by the way. Who knows? I'm gonna get, if I didn't clear that up, though, I'd get email. One of the hardest lessons to learn is that God answers every prayer. 
Sometimes the answer is no. That's a hard lesson to learn. Now, this bit about the lottery and horse racing and all, it's a very simplistic illustration, but I think you get the point. God, the good shepherd, provides those things that we need. The things that we want is a completely different story. But are the things we need going to fall from the sky? Well, maybe. But chances are they usually don't. God gives us the skill that we need, hopefully, to earn a living and to put a roof over our heads and to put food on the table. Sometimes the system works against us. But God has given the farmer the skill to grow the food and others to make clothing as Tabitha did to keep us warm and protected. And if we lack these things or the ability to produce these things, hopefully there are other means to find support because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Sometimes the need is filled by others outside the circle like us and the things that as a community we provide to those in need. That's part of us fulfilling our call to love everyone, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, visit those who are sick in prison. But this psalm is just not about God providing material things. It's about the spiritual provision that comes from our relationship to God. It's funny how everything in Scripture eventually comes back to this idea of spirituality. Who would have thought? With God, we can, and hopefully we have, experienced love. The shepherd is always one step ahead of the sheep, making sure that the path is safe, that there's no dangers ahead. Sometimes in our quest to accumulate more, we neglect our health and stress begins to mount. And if we find that those times and we find places that help us to restore our soul, then we're better off in the long run. A long time ago, John Wesley had these things that were called class meetings. They were gatherings of people of like mind and belief. And he would always start the meeting off by asking, how is your soul? Not how are you? How is your soul? Think about that. How is your soul? What are we doing to feed our soul? What are we doing to care for our soul? With God, we have someone to place our faith in. Again, I hope we do. God will never leave us and is with us in the good times and in the bad. I often think of the poem that's called Footprints in the Sand. You all know it. Sometimes we walk with God. Sometimes God carries us. And the line that's left out of that poem is sometimes God is dragging us behind him. <laughs> the assurance that God the Good Shepherd is walking beside us should bring us comfort in those times of trial. In God we have a reason to hope. Now I know that it can be difficult in these times that we're living in to have hope in anything. And it's become even more difficult the last few years for some. But our hope needs to be in God and in God alone. Because I think as, we've, as history has shown, everything else will let us down. The friends of Tabitha had hope and they placed their hope in God. God was faithful. Now many people have lost their faith. They've lost their faith in God. And they've lost their faith for a variety of reasons. Some, sometimes it was and is the institutional church that has let them down. Other times it was individuals associated with the institutional church that has let people down. 
I've been there. I've experienced the hurt that comes when these things happen. My faith wavered for a time. I lost my faith for a time. But I was drawn back because someone cared enough to reach out. Now perhaps you are one who has been hurt or has lost their faith, or your faith is kind of shaky. Perhaps you know someone who's been hurt or who has lost their faith. The invitation is there, and the invitation should come from us for all to come and to find rest for your soul. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's in the woods. Maybe it's by a stream, in a pasture, wherever it is. God is not confined to these four walls. God exists everywhere. One of the things that Jesus did in turning sort of the liturgical life of people upside down was this idea that God only existed in the temple. And that's where we went. We went to the temple and we worshipped God. But God exists everywhere. And we can find God everywhere if we're looking. But we need to let others know that God cares and that loves everyone. Even in times when it appears that those who claim to follow God do not. How many times have we seen that? How many times have we seen so-called religious people who profess to follow the same Jesus that we follow act in a very opposite manner and in a very opposite way? They're usually the ones that get all the press. But we're out there. We're doing our thing. We need to do it more. <coughs> but we need to be the ones who just reach our hand out and say, come, see, heal, find rest. The psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. The psalmist makes no claim for the church or for others, only for God. Today I invite you to come and find that rest. Come all who are weary and heavy laden. And my hope is that each of us will now extend that invitation to others. Because maybe we can be that shepherd for someone who needs to find a safe way, who needs to find a path, and who needs to find a place for their own refreshment.